Okay. Chapter 2 on faith in God. So now we're going to get into specific topics in theology. Um, remember, Machen is uh, emphasizing the important fact that Christianity includes the uh, exposition of Christian doctrine. We believe that God reveals himself in ways which we can understand and our uh, understanding of, of Scripture is pivotal for our genuine Christian experience. So uh, he's going to take us through uh, some basics of the Christian faith in the course of our study. We're looking at the nature of God. We'll take a look at faith in Jesus at a later point. We're going to be a little while yet here on the definition, if you will, of God. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about the basics of the gospel message, uh, man's sin, the, the message of the gospel, the way of salvation, um, the nature, relationship between faith and works, and then hope, which is uh, a view of uh, the end times. And uh, Machen has as his uh, apologetic a defense of true Christianity against the modernism that was working its way into and dominating, dominating really, uh, the Presbyterian Church, the mainline Presbyterian Church, PCUSA is what it is today. Um, so that's what he's addressing, but these ideas circulate all throughout um, Protest mainline Protestant Christianity. So Lutheranism, Episcopalian churches, Methodist churches, United Church of Christ, um, all these churches have been influenced by these basic core ideas. So um, this is not just simply a Presbyterian issue, although Machen is specifically dealing with that, but it's something that has infected if you will, Western Christianity. Um, I, I'd be curious to see the relationship between these ideas and the Roman Catholic Church and the development of that as well. I think that in, in that environment, um, you, you, the Roman Church is a, a very monolithic church. It's got a wide variety of ideas within it. Um, such as you have right now with the Pope, Pope Francis being more of a socialist and probably out of step with a lot of the conservatives within the, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I know our friend Bob uh, is not very happy with the present Pope, and uh, I'm sure uh, there are different points of view within the, the Church. So uh, I'm sure these ideas manifest themselves in the Roman Catholic Church as well. So we'll, we'll work our way through this and uh, see what Machen has to say. Uh, he writes at the start of this, and again, I'm sorry I can't present this. We'll, I'll just have to read it for you. And I'm on page 46 in my copy of the book. Um, if you, I think Rick has an older copy, but I don't know if that's the same page or not. But yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, same page for me. Okay, very good. So. We're all on the same page. That's good. <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> Machen writes, In the first place, the Bible certainly tells us that faith involves a person as its object. We can indeed speak about having faith in an impersonal object, such as a machine. But when we do so, I think we are indulging in a sort of personification of that object. Or else, we are really thinking about the men who made the machine. At any rate, without discussing the correctness or incorrectness of this usage, we can at least say that such a use of the word stops short of the highest significance. In the highest significance of the word, the significance in which alone we are now interested, faith is regarded as being always reposed in persons. So when I get out into my uh, Lincoln Town Car and I take it for a ride, I have a lot of confidence in the car, but basically my confidence is in the team that repairs the car <laughs> and keeps it running. So when I get it inspected, uh, I'm assuming that they're checking it out, making sure it's safe to drive. And so my faith is in the machine, but it's in the machine as designed by the engineers at Ford, Lincoln, Mercury, and so forth, and then the mechanics who op, you know, keep it up to date and keep it running properly. So there's faith in, in the car, uh, but faith 
more directly in those who built the car and maintained the car. And so I have uh, that kind of faith. So you can see how Machen uh, tries to emphasize that faith is uniquely connected to persons. I have faith that this chair is going to hold me up. It's based on experience that I've been in for quite a while. But I know that at some point it could collapse on me, hopefully <laughs> not on camera. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's also faith in, in the people who designed it and uh, the construction materials that they used and so forth, that everything's going to support me in it. So ultimately, there, there, a person is the object of faith. And that's all that Mason is trying to indicate. Now, saying that raises problems. And, and Mason is going to develop that. Uh, if I have faith in a person, do I need to have a doctrinal statement about who that person is? and Or do I just have a relationship there? Uh, and, and so that, that's kind of the, the, the direction we'll be going. He's, he writes, the person's in whom, according to the Bible, faith is particularly to be reposed, are God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I might expand that and say it's in the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in the uh, Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who came to be our mediator, the Son of God. But, and here we come to the point which we think ought to be emphasized above all others, just at the present day, it is impossible to have faith in a person without having knowledge of the person. Far from being contrasted with knowledge, faith is founded upon knowledge. That assertion runs counter to the whole trend of contemporary religious teaching. But a little reflection, I think, will show that it is indubitably correct and that it must be applied specifically specifically to the objects of Christian faith. Let us consider from this point of view, first, faith in God, and second, faith in Jesus Christ. So we have in front of us, a, on your computer screen, uh, pictures of various people uh, who are part of this group, and I can take a look at Rick and say, there are certain propositions that I know about him that are true. And that distinguishes Rick from Mike, for example. So Rick, I met out in uh, Texas, and he was in Oklahoma. We were pastors out there. Uh, we worked in the same presbytery. We, we uh, had probably had some debates here and there in the course of the presbytery experience. I don't know. I don't remember that. But then we worked together in the presbytery of Philadelphia. Rick, so, so I got a whole list of experiences and information about Rick that distinguish him from everybody else here. And the same can be said for each of you. Certain things that I know about you, I can say about you, and that makes you unique to me. So Jack is in Florida, Chuck is in New York, Mike's nearby. You know, it's just these different uh, propositions that we can say which distinguish each, you know, each of us and make us unique as persons and uh, as uh, people that we know. Uh, if I didn't know anything about Rick at all, not even his name, I just see an image of him in front of me. How can I say that I know him? Uh, there, there'd just be no connection there. Um, I just have an experience of a picture, and that's all. Um, so I can make certain judgments about his picture or something, you know, how he looks and that sort of thing, where he's located and that sort of thing, but uh, that's not really knowing him. So um, to continue, in the classic treatment of faith in the epistle to the Hebrews, there is a verse that goes to the very root of the matter. He that cometh to God, the author says, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Uh, that's Hebrews 11, verse 6. Here we find a rejection in advance of all the pragmatist, non-doctrinal Christianity of modern times. So his use of the word pragmatist reminds us of what he's been telling us in the introduction, that there is an emphasis on pragmatism today in the Christian church. We don't need to be arguing about points of theology and doctrine. We just need to do that which is necessary for our present life. We need to learn how to love one another. And so uh, we're very practical. We're very this world oriented. Um, and Machen's point is that that pragmatism is not beneficial but harmful. 
it leads us away from a true knowledge of God. And so you end up with just a, a, a moral system uh, disconnected from uh, the God who has given us that moral system. Okay, so uh, Machen continues, In the first place, religion is here made to depend absolutely upon doctrine. The one who comes to God must not only believe in a person, but he must also believe that something is true. Faith is here declared to involve acceptance of a proposition. There could be no plainer insistence upon the doctrinal or intellectual basis of faith. It is impossible, according to the epistle to the Hebrews, to have faith in a person without accepting with the mind the facts about the person. So a proposition is a statement. Uh, you got remember your lessons in English grammar. You got the subject and the predicate. You're making an assertion about something. This is uh, in uh, grammarial terms. This is the indicative mood of something. You're just stating a fact. And so we come to God and we state a fact about God. Um, he is. As the writer to the Hebrew says, he exists and is a rewarder of those who seek him. So entirely different is the prevailing attitude in the modern church. Far from recognizing, as the author of Hebrews does, the intellectual basis of faith, many modern preachers set faith in sharp opposition to knowledge. Christian faith, they say, is not assent to a creed, but it is confidence in a person. The epistle to the Hebrews, on the other hand, declares that it is impossible to have confidence in a person without assenting to a creed. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. The words God is or God exists constitute a creed. They constitute a proposition. And yet they are here placed as necessary to that supposedly non-intellectual thing that is called faith. It would be impossible to find a more complete opposition than that which, is, which here appears between the New Testament and the anti-intellectualistic tendency of modern preaching. So the modern preacher emphasizes that our faith is in a person. And it's disconnected with doctrine, because doctrine seems to be scientific, mechanical, arbitrary, and we want to push that aside and just have a living experience of a person. The problem is you can't have a living experience of a person without knowing something about that person. And uh, that's foundational to that experience. Um, Machen will get into the idea of mysticism here in a little bit, but uh, the point at the moment is that Modernism makes this bifurcation between a personal relationship and uh, a creedal statement, a doctrinal statement about that person. And really it's in modernism, but you, you may find it as well in some areas of the evangelical church where it's no creed but Christ. Um, uh, I want to have a personal relationship with God and that sort of thing. And uh, you need to have that personal relationship but you need to know who it is you're having a personal personal relationship with. You're having a religious experience, but how do you know that it's with, in fact, Jesus Christ and with the true God and not with something you're imagining or with um, even Satan himself. Satan presents himself as an angel of light. So how do you know that the experience you are having is an experience of the true God and not an experience, a delusional experience, of Satan. Um, you have people in the drug culture who take a drug and they have an experience of something. Maybe it's an experience of a flower <laughs> or a bird. Or, you know, just something that all of a sudden has a mystical uh, experience for them and they get uh, kind of in a state of rapture from that. But they're not having an experience with God in Jesus Christ. So who is it that you're having an experience with? Uh, Machen continues top of 48. 
But here as elsewhere, the Bible is found to be true to the plainest facts of the soul. Whereas the modern separation between faith in a person and acceptance of a creed is found to be psychologically false. It is perfectly true, of course, that faith in a person is more than acceptance of a creed. But the Bible is quite right in holding that it always involves acceptance of a creed. That's a statement of faith, a doctrinal statement. Confidence in a person is more than intellectual assent to a series of propositions about the person, but it always involves those propositions and becomes impossible the moment they are denied. It is quite impossible to trust a person about whom one assents to propositions that make the person untrustworthy or fails to assent to propositions that make him, that make him trustworthy. Assent to, a certain, to certain propositions is not the whole of faith, but it is an absolutely necessary element in faith. So assent to certain propositions about God is not all of faith in God, but it is necessary to faith in God. And Christian faith in particular, though it is more than a, an assent to a creed, is absolutely impossible without assent to a creed. One cannot trust a God whom one holds with the mind to be either non-existent or untrustworthy. So, put yourself in the, the seat of uh, uh, President Zelensky in Ukraine, and he's got to make a, a, a pact with uh, Putin in Russia. And you're sitting down across the table with him. Do you trust Putin to keep his word? <laughs> you have certain facts and information about him, which I think would, would suggest that he is not to be trusted. And so, Zelensky would want certain guarantees to make sure that Putin abides by the pact, the treaty that is formed here. And so he wants other people involved in the whole process uh, to provide stability there. But you see, there's certain information about Putin that comes into play that determines whether you trust him or not. The, tr the, the information here in this situation is negative information, it seems to me. Uh, Putin lied about the presence of troops on the the border of Ukraine, Putin or Russia made a, a treaty to take Ukraine's nuclear weapons and, and promised to protect them from attack. <laughs> they themselves attack Ukraine. So they have a real credibility problem there because you have certain information there that goes against the credibility of the person, Putin. Um, so uh, information is always necessary in order for you to trust somebody. Uh, you need to, to know that person and be able to say certain things about them that are true and worthy of trust. The epistle to the Hebrews, therefore, is quite right in maintaining that, quote, He that cometh to God must believe that he is. In order to trust God or to have communion with him, we must at least believe that he exists. Okay, that seems to be a truism. Uh, well, he's going to... Machen's going to say that here in a moment. Um, seems rather obvious. Um, if you believe in somebody, well, first of all, you believe that they exist. Otherwise, why would you believe? I mean, do I believe in fairy tales? Do I believe in Peter Pan and Mickey Mouse and that sort of thing? Um, you know, in the modernist point of view, you can't have a certain faith in Mickey Mouse and Peter Pan and Superman and these kinds of things because they hold a mythical value for you some kind of psychological value to you and you learn and benefit, you're instructed by that experience with Mickey Mouse, Superman, Donald Duck, and in their view, Jesus Christ. Um, there's a mythical value there that you can benefit from and, and that's all that they're, they're trying to say. Um, uh, we believe Jesus is a historical person, God exists, and so forth. Um, to continue, at first sight, that might seem to be a mere truism. It might seem to be nothing, or excuse me, it might seem to be something that every sane person would be obliged to accept. As a matter of fact, however, 
even this apparently self-evident proposition, is rejected by a great mass of persons in the modern world. And it has been rejected by many persons in the course of religious history. What the epistle to the Hebrews accomplishes by enunciating the simple proposition, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, is the repudiation of that important phenomenon in the history of religion that is known as mysticism. Okay, he's introducing the topic of mysticism here, and we'll follow that, follow that. as we go from here. Um, but, uh, again, just note that this is an idea that is prevalent in the modern world uh, from Machen's point of view. It's something that has taken root across the cultures. And indeed, if you were to take a look at the idea of mysticism and uh, where it manifests itself in the world today, you have Eastern mysticism. You're familiar with that. Remember, most of us are of an age where we can rem remember the age of Aquarius coming across um, into the Western world. And this Eastern New Age thinking comes into view and the idea of binaries, uh, opposites, true and false, that sort of thing, uh, gets done away with. What counts is your experience. Um, mysticism is in Hinduism. It's in the Jewish faith. Uh, it, it's manifested in a wide variety of ways. So um, we're looking at something that has uh, an impact on the world around us, but has also infiltrated the outwardly professing Christian church. So, uh, we have this proposition here, it, it, he that comes to God must believe that he is, and Machen's going to unpack that for a moment. Um, uh, just be mindful that existence means reality. <laughs> there is a metaphysical reality, just as you are sitting in your office or in your uh, family room, what have you, in your home, uh, though just a picture of you is on my screen, but I know that you're there, there's a real person on the other side of the computer here. Um, so also God has a real existence uh, in, in the world. And it's not just a, a fantasy, not just a, a, um, a mythology that gives us some measure of comfort and hope and encouragement along the way. So existence is important. Uh, Machen continues... Uh, the true mystic holds that communion with God is an ineffable experience, which is independent of any intellectual propositions, whatever. Ineffable is a word which means you cannot explain it. It's not uh, reducible to words uh, or propositions. It's just an experience. So it's ineffable, undescribable. Uh, so the true mystic says that communion with God is indescribable. It cannot be reduced to human words and language. Um, religion, the mystic holds, in its pure form is independent of the intellect. When it is expressed in an intellectual mold, it is cabined and confined. Such expression can be nothing more than symbolic. Religious experience itself does not depend upon assent to any kind of creed. So this idea of symbolism has come across us a, a, a number of times. Uh, you, you, in, in the mystical view, you have this experience of God and your words and language that you try to use to explain this mystical experience are just simply um, a bare reflection of that experience but not in any way to be tied to it. They are symbolical of the experience. They, um, uh, relate to it, but they're not the experience itself. Uh, if I can, I don't know if Rick can help me with a better explanation for that. But um, so uh, the the sense is that any attempt to explain God and reduce Him to a set of propositions is, as uh, Machen describes here, uh, cabining God, like putting God in a cabin confining him to a certain area and he's confined by this intellectual fence that we put around him and, and that's where we find God and that's all that God is. So we control God with our words, with our propositions and this sort of thing. And 
so mysticism tries to explode that and say you cannot confine God who is ineffable to our human propositions because our human propositions are fallible, they're finite, uh, and so they're just a bare reflection at best of what is an indescribable experience. Um, I, I think you see that in, uh, I, I believe, if I'm correct, the, the theology of Karl Barth uh, to a certain extent that um, we, we can talk about God, but in the end, you cannot control God with your sets of propositions about Him. And so a, a specific uh, set of propositions can only do so much for you. Okay, in opposition to this mystical attitude, the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews insists, that the, insists upon the primacy of the intellect he bases religion squarely upon truth. He does not, of course, reject that immediate and mysterious contact of the soul with God, which is dear to the mystic's heart. For that immediate contact of the soul with God is a vital part of all religion worthy of the name. But he does break down the mystical separation between the experience on the one hand and the knowledge of God on the other. And in doing so, he is uttering not a truism, but an important truth. He is delivering a salutary blow against anti-intellectual mysticism, ancient and modern. There could be, under present conditions, no more timely text in the presence of this stupendous utterance, so far-reaching yet so simple, the non-doctrinal religion of the present day seems to be but a shallow and ephemeral thing. So, the primacy of the intellect is something that uh, Machen is going to be emphasizing here, and he's already emphasized it in the introduction. Uh, God's given us a mind, uh, an intellect. It, we are made in God's image. We reflect the mind and intellect of God. And there's a certain way in which we are able to understand God because he has been pleased to reveal himself in ways that are understandable to us. And so uh, a, a proposition about God can be understood truly by us, although not comprehensively, but at least truly by us, because God has made us in his image, because God has revealed them to us by his word, and he, he's done that in a way which we can understand him. So the primacy of the intellect comes into view here. Now, the one thing to note here uh, as we go forward is that there is a true Christian mysticism. Uh, you can read about that a little bit in a, a book by uh, Edmund Clowney. Um, I, think, uh, now the, I think the title of it is Trans... Christian Transcendentalism, something to that effect. But anyway, um, we do have a mystical experience of God. God is beyond us. He is ineffable. He is um, uh, beyond our human knowing uh, such that we can comprehend God and fully explain Him. He is infinite. We're finite. And so we cannot grasp the infinite God. That much is true. The problem with mysticism in terms of what we're dealing with here, is that it stops there and says the experience of God is ineffable, unexplainable, it's just an experience, and there's no place for doctrine, no place for a description of this experience. Christian faith, Scripture, um, Hebrews 11 verse 6, tells us that there are propositions about God which are true, that we can know, and indeed, that faith is connected to those propositions in such a way that faith depends on the truth of those propositions. So, true faith, according to the writer of the Hebrews who's writing a long exposition of the nature of faith here, true faith will have certain propositions about God to which it holds. It holds them to be true. And that's foundational to a true Christian mysticism. So the ineffable experience is there. A relationship with God as a person involves a, a sense of God's transcendence, that he's above me, beyond me, greater than I. Uh, his ways are 
past finding out. Um, you find this in Scripture time and time again, uh, that, that God's ways are past finding out. He, he can do uh, far more than what we ask or think. All these kinds of things come into view here. Um, but God is beyond us, but he has revealed himself to us in ways which we can understand. And that's something that Scripture supports. So continuing, top of page 50. Where are we at in time? 10.38. It is not true then, according to the New Testament, that religion is independent of doctrine or that faith is independent of knowledge. On the contrary, communion with God or faith in God is dependent upon the doctrine of his existence. But it is dependent upon other doctrines in addition to that. He that cometh to God, says the epistle to the Hebrews, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In this latter part of the sentence we have expressed in a concrete way the great truth of the personality of God. God, according to the epistle to the Hebrews, is one who can act, act in view of a judgment upon those who come to him. What we have here in the second part of the sentence is a presentation of what the Bible elsewhere calls the living God. God not only exists, but is a free person who can act. So we're following through the writer to the Hebrews' line of thought. God exists, and that tells us something about God. There, there is a present reality of God, and then that invites us to define, well, what is God? That definition of God exists, that, that understanding of God exists, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and being, wisdom, and so forth in our shorter catechism. Uh, God exists, and specifically, he in terms of the nature of faith, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith focuses on the fact of God's existence and that he rewards those who seek him. I was reading uh, in my devotions this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, a, a ruler comes up to Jesus as he's walking along and says that his uh, daughter has died, but if you uh, come come, you can heal her, you can raise her up. And Jesus agrees to go, and as he's walking to this ruler's house, a woman who has had an experience of hemorrhaging for years upon years, and I think uh, probably Luke tells us that uh, she had sought many doctors and found no relief from them, she comes to Jesus as Jesus is walking by, and in her mind her heart she says, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And so she does that, touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed. And Jesus turns around to her, Matthew's Gospel, and says to her, Woman, your faith has made you well. So here's a woman who believed that Jesus had the power to heal her. And she acted on that faith. There's a proposition about Jesus. He is one who rewards those who seek him. She comes to him. And then he blesses her and says, your faith has made you well. Your faith has been rooted in Jesus and in his ability to heal. And by acting on that faith, uh, Jesus was pleased to bring her healing. Uh, so, faith and uh, an ex a sense that God is able to reward that faith when it comes to him uh, is essential to true Christian faith. Okay. The same truth appears even, excuse me, with even greater clearness in the third verse of the great of the same great chapter. Through faith we understand, says the author, that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Here we have expressed in a clearness that leaves nothing to be desired, the doctrine of creation out of nothing. And that doctrine is said to be, to be received by faith. It is the same doctrine that appears in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
And that really is presupposed in the Bible from beginning to the end. Yet the prevalent religious tendency in the church of the present day relegates that doctrine to the realm of the non-essential. What has religion to do, we are asked, with the obsolete notion of fiat creation? Fiat creation is the sense that God speaks and the worlds are created. In our modern, modern scientific world, we do away with that. We see that the world uh, comes about through time and chance, uh, uh, um, random actions over a period of time which produce the intelligent life that we see today and so forth. And so uh, science has dismissed the need of religion to explain the origins of the world. And so we can dismiss the idea of creation and say that that's not all that important anymore. But uh, clearly the writer to the Hebrews considers that doctrine to be significant. I got lost here. Okay. Top of page 51. The truth is that in the epistle to the Hebrews, as well as in the rest of the Bible, we are living in a world of thought that is diametrically opposed to the anti-intellectualism of the present day. Certain things, according to the Bible, are known about God, and without these things there can be no faith. To the pragmatist skepticism of the modern religious world, therefore, the Bible is sharply opposed. Against the passionate anti-intellectualism of a large part of the modern church, it maintains the primacy of the intellect. It teaches plainly that God has given to men a faculty of reason which is capable of apprehending truth, even truth about God. Um, this comes into play with regard to the doctrine of the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. In uh, modern mainline thought, there is a rejection of the idea of an inerrant Word of God, or of uh, God revealing Himself in propositions that are to be believed. Um, again, God is ineffable, the religious experience is ineffable, what you have in the Bible is the witness to that experience by the biblical authors, uh, and you know, to be truthful in the mainline point of view, it's not really the biblical authors who express this, but some uh, scribes, unknown scribes and editors centuries later that use the name of Moses or the name of David, what have you, to uh, promote their particular ideas about God, so they really disconnected themselves from God's revelation in His Word. Uh, Reformed theology emphasizes propositional revelation, which is inerrant and true, and which we can uh, place our faith upon. Um, so again, the primacy of the intellect uh, stands opposed to the anti-intellectualism of uh, many in the church, and you can say many in our culture today. Um, people have no problem contradicting themselves, saying one thing at one point and something entirely different at another, and not thinking that there's anything to it. That does not mean that we finite creatures can find out God by our own searching, but it does mean that God has made us capable of receiving the information which He chooses to give. I cannot evolve an account of China out of my own inner consciousness, but I am perfectly capable of understanding the account which comes to me from travelers who have been there themselves. So our reason is certainly insufficient to tell us about God unless He reveals Himself, but it is capable or would be capable, if it were not clouded by sin, of receiving revelation once it is given. Um, I've not been to China yet. Hopefully I never will, <laughs> under the present circumstances. Um, although I, I'm sure that China would be an interesting place to visit. Uh, uh, a friend of mine went to China, and there is apparently a, a cave with statues in it. There tall statues, like a hundred of these statues or something like that. And people like to go see that or the Great Wall of China. Uh, I believe that that stuff's there based on the testimony of people who've been there. 
but I myself could not think of that on my own, using my reasoning, uh, just merely by an analytical uh, analysis of the idea of China. <laughs> There's nothing that would come from that. I would have to have somebody report to me what they saw, or I myself would have to go there and see it for myself. Similarly, if we are to know God, He must reveal Himself to us. And in that way, I can understand certain things about God because, again, He has made me in such a way that I can receive that revelation and know it truly, not comprehensively, but truly sufficiently for my salvation. And that is uh, the point here. So, um, our reason is insufficient on its own terms. We depend on revelation. God's revelation of himself to man embraces, indeed, only a small part of his being. The area of what we know is infinitesimal compared with the area of what we do not know. But partial knowledge is not necessarily false knowledge. Our knowledge of God on the basis of his revelation of himself is, we hold, true as far as it goes. Uh, if I look up into this, the sky at nighttime, I can see a handful of stars and perhaps the moon and make certain deductions about that. I, I regularly see uh, certain constellations, the Big Dipper um, and a couple of others. Trying to think of the one that I always see, um, the, the, the constellation of the man standing there. Orion. Orion is that it? Orion. Orion. Yeah, the three belts. Yeah, three stars, three stars for the belt. belt. Yeah. 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 Um, it must have been a fighter in the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so I, I can make certain propositions about the, the movement of the moon and, the, and a handful of stars that I can see. I can see there are other stars out there that are fairly faint. And then if I go up to Vermont, where there's no light from surrounding cities and that sort of thing, I'm in a totally black night and I can look up, I can see the Milky Way, the whole galaxy, like a huge, vast amount of stars just with the naked eye. And then if I get a telescope, I can even see more. And then if you get some of these super telescopes or go put a telescope out in space and then begin to look at things, you even see galaxies upon galaxies and you have an incredible view of the universe. So I can know certain things about God. I can know certain things about the world around me. But as more and more revelation comes, I can increase my knowledge of God or my knowledge of the world around me. In the end, I depend upon God being willing to reveal himself to me in ways that I can see and understand. Uh, so I, I guess you could say that uh, God's Word is the telescope through which we see God more accurately, more perfectly. But anyway, uh, there are limits to what God has revealed, and certainly um, there will be much more to learn about Him in the future. Where are we at in time? 10.51. Okay. Why don't we finish up here and... Uh, take the opportunity for questions or just a time of fellowship and hey you know rich when, when you were talking about seeing the stars and how if you get up to maine or wherever you can see more and more i was yeah. thinking about that that relates to the um, the abortion issue in science as the more and more you discover the more and more you find that life begins at conception right so yeah. so they they keep going uh, as they make they make these uh, laws and assumptions based on what they can see at the moment, but the more that is revealed as science progresses, the more they realize that they're wrong, mm -hmm. and life begins much earlier than previously thought. So that's a it's a good example of how you know science can work in in your favor um, of re of revealing every a lot more than what's out there. You know, yeah. so now the stars and also about life itself. Mm -hmm. you know? so. But so. I was th also thinking of, of the verse, uh, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God from, from John. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, there, there's the, um, the knowledge of God 
and the creed, you know, that there is, there, there's the, the description of, of not just knowing that there's a God, but also that he is the word, everything we, he is the creed. And, and then the, the mystical is the Holy Spirit opening that word to, uh, to the believer uh, and understanding it. So, so they, they, it's, all, it's all tied together. It's, you, you can't, you can't uh, divorce them from one another. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you need to have so. Yeah, I, I was, as Mike was talking a moment ago about abortion, a couple of thoughts came to my mind. Uh, he was talking about the advance of science, and, you know, with the advance of science, you begin to see more of the truth of Scripture. I'm reminded of the illustration of the uh, scientists climbing up a hill and they're exploring things, and they get up to the very top of the hill. And once they've made all their final discoveries, they get up to the top, and there is a, a religious figure at the top saying, "Where you been?" <laughs> <laughs> I do this already. God's word revealed it. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, the other thing is, you know, with the advance of technology, as Mike said, that it, it makes the the position of uh, the abortionist much more untenable. I mean, that, you go back years ago to Bernard Nathanson, who um, began using, was it sonograms, and, and seeing what, how a baby responds to an abortion through the sonogram, and he saw what he called the silent scream, as the baby you know, reacts to the, the medical instruments coming in or to the, the chemicals coming in. I mean, it, it was a horrible thing to observe. And it became apparent to him that this is just not, you know, a blob or something. It's a real person there. And so he, he became, after being a, an abortionist, a leading figure in the abortion movement in New York City, um, he uh, then fought against it. Um, so technology had its impact. And that's why you, you'll notice that on television, you, they will never let you see the development of a baby within the womb or especially the, the byproduct of the abortion experience. Um, the images w would persuade many that this is an evil thing and it must be stopped. Um, so it, the mainstream media will just cover that up. Uh, I remember if you were protesting and you go off with a sign with a picture of, of a baby in the womb, uh, that would be um, anathema to the press. They would not want to show that at all. Um.